Walt Disney always wanted to be a live action filmmaker when he first came to Hollywood and he could not get a job making live action films. So he went back to producing animated films and then the rest was history. But he really never gave up that dream of being a live action filmmaker. And one of the things that actually helped make that dream come true for him was World War II. When the Second World War was over, England's finest hour had left her broke. And one of the things they did to try to help things along was to freeze all the money that was owed to other countries. And that included a lot that was owed to Walt Disney. All the money that uh, Disney earned in Britain from uh, the exhibition of his films, Pinocchio, Fantasia, Bambi, Dumbo, couldn't be taken out of the country. So Roy Disney, Walt's brother, wonderful businessman that he was, talked to Walt about making productions in England where they could spend those frozen funds. Walt had a wonderful advantage in filming in the United Kingdom in that he had wonderful studios, wonderful talent behind the camera and in front of the camera. That was a tremendous resource for Walt. I think what he saw here was the potential to be able to make the kind of stories that he really wanted to make in live action. Because Walt was above all a storyteller, and so many of the stories that he wanted to tell had come out of England in the first place. When Walt started making live action films in England, he turned first to British history and British literature. Walt's favorite writers were Mark Twain, the quintessential American writer, and uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, the quintessential British writer. So, of course, the idea of starting out by making Treasure Island, that fit right in with what Walt loved. So, in 1950, he made his very first completely live-action film, Treasure Island. Doctor! Flint's map! And then he went on and he made the story of Robin Hood and his merry man. Stutely, to the south! And Rob Roy and the Sword and the Rose. And it was wonderful for him to personally be on a set watching live action filmmaking. Byron Haskin directed Treasure Island. He was a good director and got a wonderful performance out of Robert Newton. Ain't that a beauty now? Then Walt brought in a director that uh, he'd keep with him for quite a few years, and that was Ken Anakin. Ken Anakin came to first direct the story of Robin Hood. He directed The Sword and the Rose. Years later, for Walt, he would direct Swiss Family Robinson and The Third Man on the Mountain. The first time I actually met Walt, I was testing an actor to play Friar Tuck. And I turned around, and there was Walt. And he waved me like this, so I went over. And Walt said, I have a very clear view of how I think Friar Tuck acts. He knew all the words of a script, and he gave a performance, even singing the song that Friar Tuck sings in the picture. And when he'd finished, the whole crew applauded him. He said, well, that's how I see him. You go ahead now and do what you, what you feel about him. Sword and the Rose was the second picture I made for him. This is one of the one pictures that didn't have any appeal to young people. Believe it or not, he decided I'm going to make a picture that really reflects my view and my experience of coping with powerful people. Come forth and receive the ambassadors of France. Don Chafee was one of the directors that Walt liked to use over in England. Don Chafee started with Walt in 1961 with Greyfriars Bobby. I 
You come to me, it helps you belong to me. And did seven films for Walt. The director of Dr. Sin was James Nielsen. Nielsen had done several films for Walt in Hollywood, and Walt assigned for his first film in England, Scarecrow of Romney Marsh. Walt, whenever he tried something new, would be very involved. He really cared about the storytelling, and he was himself a master storyteller. But he also trusted his team to put together the story and show it to him. Hearst Pierce was the person that kind of watched out for the filmmaking that was going on in England when Walt couldn't be there personally. Walt seemed to rely on him more than anybody as a producer because he was a very honest man and he was absolutely devoted to film and he was really Walt's right-hand man. Hearst Pierce was a sequence director on Snow White he was a story man on Pinocchio, and he was the head of story on Bambi. Frank Thomas of the great Disney animators called Purse Pierce the best story man after Walt at the Disney studio. England was filled with wonderful craftspeople who had done amazing things in British films. For example, Walt's favorite art director was Carmen Dillon, a little woman, very intense, and with a fantastic memory for all kinds of details. Carmen Dillon knew everything about every piece of furniture, every object, every brick, and every brack. It was Carmen Dillon who found Peter Allen Shaw. Peter was a mat painter. This is a, a sheet of glass. You make a painting on it. You shoot through the glass, and it's in a proportion to the set behind it, so it looks real. Walt could talk to you on the level of an artist. He could transfer his feelings into you. He really had a wonderful way of doing this. Walt Disney went with his crew to Nottingham, to the forest, and he said, well, the oaks are good, but the castles are run down. He said, Peter Allenshaw, you could paint better castles than they have here in Nottingham, can't you? Oh, yes, Walt, of course. Well, fine, we'll use Peter's castles, and it will look like merry old England. It'll be a lot better than this. Walt fell so much in love with what he could do that he then hired Ellen Shaw to come to America and be established in the studio and did all the painted mats for every picture that Walt did after that. Walt Disney's Disneyland. Walt knew this was an opportunity to start making films for the Disneyland television show and then re-edit them and release them theatrically. At the time, color televisions were not everywhere, so the films had to look good in black and white, but they also had to look good in color. The green, the sunshine, the sparkle, what you think of as the English countryside that came from those marvelous cinematographers who loved England themselves. Guy Green was absolute perfectionist. There was one scene he was having to light He'd been at it all morning, and as we broke for lunch, he said, sorry, Ken, didn't work. I'll, I'll do it again after lunch. Guy was the one who really made Walt very happy and certainly established what could be done if you came to England. Walt really enjoyed visiting Europe. It was an opportunity to share some of his work and have a little bit of vacation with his wife, Lily, and his daughters. And he was always like a sponge, absorbing whatever he saw went into the back of his mind as an idea for, for something else. Walt well, we would watch a little bit of the shooting, and then he heard about a model railway a man had in Beaconsfield. He spent nearly a week with his model railway, and this, of course, was the beginnings of 
what he would use in Disneyland. The films that Walt made in England were always very highly regarded. Great care had gone into the making of these films, and they were well written, they were well directed, they had excellent casts. It's Thomasina. She's come back. And by taking advantage of location shooting, he was able to inject into all of these stories a wonderful sense of reality, but also an opportunity to show audiences some of the beauties of the rest of the world. What those English movies mean in the legacy of film is they give you a way to pass on to your children and your children's children what an English woman, what an Englishman is like at their best. This is what the great stories have always done.